Well, good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 21, and here we're going to see where Paul does make it to Jerusalem, and he ends up being arrested. So as we get started tonight, let's pray and go to the Lord. Father, we thank you again for just another time that we can gather together in your name and study your word, God. It is such a joy to be able to look at your word and hear directly from you, God. So, Lord, we pray right now as we, as we read and as we observe and as we think about what it is you're teaching us, that we will take what we're learning and we will apply it to our hearts. And that we will see the hospitality of the believers tonight, Lord God. And, and we will see, Lord God, just how Paul responded when people's hands, the very hands that were causing him to suffer so much, how he responded to them. And Father, there's so many lessons tonight. So Lord, I pray that we have a passion for missions and I pray that we have a passion for the Great Commission. And Jesus, thank you so much for saving our souls and giving us the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, tonight, as we get started, if you'll get your Bible and turn to Acts 21, and we are going to do a quick review, um, and this will be looking back at Acts chapter 20. And if you recall, as we were there, we were on Paul's third missionary journey, as you all are familiar with. And there, I'm going to highlight the section of the journey that we were talking about. If you recall, he was in Ephesus, and then he traveled up to Macedonia, then went down to Achaia, and was planning to go to Jerusalem right then. But you know what happened? They found out that there was a plot against his life from some of the Jews. And so then he had to retrace his steps back through Macedonia. And he met the rest of the people that were traveling with him at Troas. And there they reconnected. And then from there they took a ship. He did walk part of the way to Assos. Then they all got on the ship and they then made their way from port to port, uh, making their way to Jerusalem, trying to get there for the feast of Pentecost. Well, I wanted to point out where Ephesus is, and so we are going to start off at Miletus. Miletus is just a little bit south of Ephesus. As you remember, he had uh, docked there in Miletus, and the Ephesian elders had walked down to where he was, and then uh, we looked at his sermon of where he talked to the Ephesian elders. So let's review just for really quick, just a minute, but we saw how God inspired Paul to write two of the greatest documents this earth has ever seen, 2 Corinthians and Romans, and how eternally grateful we are for these inspired works. And we talked about how important it is to be reading the Word of God and, and to have these treasures, and and then in Troas, if you recall, we also saw God's mercy because you remember how Eutychus fell from the window while Paul was preaching and that how he was being taken up for dead. And then Paul then prayed over him and he was brought back to life. So we saw how God had much mercy in um, that he, he when he was, uh, Eutychus was taken up for dead, that after falling out of that window, that um, he was uh, brought back to life. So we remember how we asked the question, what are the characteristics of a true shepherd who cares for the sheep of the flock of God? Now, we were able to discern that when you think about when Paul, this was basically Paul's third major missionary uh, sermon. Um, the first one would have been at Antioch of Pisidia. The second one would have been in Athens. And this one here, outside of Ephesus at Miletus, he is talking to the Ephesian elders. And it is where he's talking and addressing the church, especially the church leadership. And so we have an entirely uh, different audience in this particular sermon. And so he talked about his life. He gave a testimony of his life. He also told about what was ahead for them. And so we were able to look at that and determine, like, what do we see here that would characterize what it means to be a shepherd, to care for the sheep and the flock of God. And we saw that as he preached this pastor sermon to these Ephesian elders, that he this was a picture of what a compassionate shepherd and a pastor would look like. And if you remember, he said that he served with all humility through many trials and tears. He also said that he had faithfully proclaimed the gospel, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You recall that he also said that he was not afraid to face the chains and the tribulations on account of the gospel. He wanted only to finish the race faithfully unto God because he was becoming aware of the fact and it was being told to him that when he was headed to Jerusalem that he would face chains and tribulation 
and he's, he was not afraid to go ahead and go to Jerusalem. And he, he could truthfully say that he was innocent of the blood of all men because he had fully preached to them the whole counsel of the Lord. And then we saw, too, where he exhorted the Ephesian elders to shepherd the church of God. The shepherds, you know, protect the flock from ravenous wolves. And then he finally, he prays for them and he commends them to the Lord. Now, if you have the handout that talks about Paul's uh, first missionary journey, you see here where this is an outline of his life and about um, going a little bit prior to that, where he was converted probably about AD 32-33. And then he had uh, this mission ministry in Nabatea, Arabia for about three years, 32 to 35. Then he had his first post-conversion um, visit to Jerusalem, about 35 or 36. And then he went to the area, if you recall, of uh, Cilicia up in, and ministry up in that area. Those are referred to as his silent years. And then, do you remember how Barnabas went and got him from Tarsus and brought him back to Antioch of Syria? And there we had his ministry there with Barnabas. And that would have been about uh, AD 45 to 46. And, and then from Antioch of Syria, they had the first missionary journey. He and Barnabas then head out. And so there you can see the rest of what we have covered uh, in Paul's life. The first missionary journey, he wrote the book of Galatians. Second missionary journey, he wrote the book of 1st, 2nd Thessalonians. And then the third missionary journey, which we have spent about two to three weeks on that journey, we now know that he wrote the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. He also evangelized uh, further into Macedonia, Elicricum, and Achaia. And he also also wrote the letter to Romans while he was in Corinth. Now he is going back to Jerusalem. This whole lesson tonight is going to be on this, this visit to Jerusalem. And this is considered his fifth and his last post-conversion visit to Jerusalem. Okay, so in tonight's lesson, again, thank you, Dr. Stevens, so much for the insight that he brings to this lesson, not only through the book that he has written, but also through many of the maps and the slides and the pictures. So this is what I want to, in tonight's lesson. You're going to see where Paul is going to complete his third missionary journey. He's going to arrive in Jerusalem, and there he's going to be arrested in the temple and falsely accused. So to, through tonight's lesson, here's what I want you to look for, okay? I want you to look for how the Holy Spirit continued to warn Paul of the upcoming, upcoming danger that he was going to face when he uh, got to Jerusalem. You know, the Bible talks about how that is one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to tell us things to come. And then I want you to also keep an eye out for all the amazing fellowship that you're going to see among the believers and their hospitality to one another and how they loved and cared for one another. Also, I want you to look for this and ask this, ask this question to yourself. Why would Paul continue on to Jerusalem knowing the danger that awaited for him? Well, there's an answer for that in the scripture. And then we're going to look at this. How do you respond to people from whom you've suffered? How did Paul respond? And we're going to see that at the very end of our lesson, how he responded to the people to whom he had suffered so much. And I want you to think about this too. This is a very interesting point. So Paul had just written the letter to the book to the Romans. Where we know that. He wrote that from, from Corinth. Um, look at this though. He's going to ask them in that letter to pray for him. And you will find this very interesting when you see how God answers two of these prayers in our lesson tonight. Paul must have had a foreboding of the danger that awaited for him in Jerusalem. Now, when he's writing to the Romans, now think about this. He's in Corinth, and he's writing, and he was there for three months. And in that time period, he wrote the letter to the Romans, uh, the, the church at Rome. And look at what he says at the end of his letter. He said, now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. So that was his first prayer request. Second, that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Okay, that's the second thing he asked them to pray for them, for him. And then the third thing was this, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. 
Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So you just watch and we're going to see how two of those prayers were answered tonight. Just think about those, those Roman Christians just hundreds of miles away um, in Rome praying for him while he is in Jerusalem. Well, first verses, uh, verses one through six, we see where Paul and his team set sail for Jerusalem. And so we'll read verses one through six, and it says, and it came to pass that when we, when we had departed from them, and that would have been from the Ephesian elders that they had met at Miletus. So Luke is now with them, and he's writing in that first person. It says that they set sail, uh, that running a straight course, we came to Kos the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. Now finding a ship sailing over to uh, Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left and sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go to Jerusalem. Now, when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. Then, Paul, then Luke continues to write, he says, and when we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. So we see here that Paul and his team are setting sail for Jerusalem, and we're going to look at each one of these little cities that they are towns that they pass through, and how it talks about how they then uh, they get to Tyre, and then they uh, and find some believers there. So what I want you to see uh, now is this map, and that is the third missionary journey. Let me show you where they're starting out from. They're starting out from Miletus, and they're going to go through three towns. Now on this map, uh, call is spelled K-O-S. In many of your translations, it will be C-O-S, but um, it mentioned those three towns right there in the scripture, okay? And so verse one, it says, it set, and set sail running a straight course. We came to Kos the following day to Rhodes and from there to Patera. And I want you to see these uh, Kos. Uh, there's another map as well, just showing that part of the journey. Uh, that's from Dr. Stevens. So Kos was one of uh, was one of the islands of the Dodecanese, uh, famed as the home of the medical school founded by Hippocrates, uh, 460 to 375 BC in the fifth century BC. That's what that island was known for. And of course, this is a modern uh, day picture of it, but you can see it's very beautiful. And then they went on to Rhodes. Now Rhodes uh, is here. The, there's two places on Rhodes. One one is uh, the city of Rhodes and the whole island is called Rhodes. So where they then uh, saw, uh, they passed through the part that was the city and uh, it was it's on the island's northeastern extremity and um, it is famous for one of the seven wonders of the ancient world and that was the Colossae of Rhodes, Rhodes and it was a statue of the Greek god uh, Helios and the size of it is very similar to our Statue of Liberty where it was about 180 Eight feet tall. Now it only stood for about 54 years because it was destroyed in an earthquake in 226 BC. So it would not have been standing when Paul was there. Okay, so they come on down through. So you see Kos and then uh, you see Rhodes. And now they, the third arrow there is they go over to, to Patera. And it says Patera there, the team is now going to turn east and they sailed along the southern coast of Lycia. Now that's a, a province. You see that on the map as well. Uh, that's the name of the province right, province right there. And it says that Patera was the headquarters of the Roman governor of the province. Okay. So then in verses two and three, we see this, that they find in a ship uh, sailing over to Phoenicia. We then, they sit, talks about how they sighted the, uh, Cyprus, which was an island there, and uh, they saw it on the left, and then they landed at Tyre. So now they would have been on a large merchant ship rather than one of the smaller crafts that were just, was, that just kind of hugged the coastline that was not meant to get out onto the open waters uh, that just kind of went from port to port. So this is going to be, uh, as you can see, that line going all the way from Patera over to Tyre, this is going to be about a 400-mile journey. 
So it's going to be quite long. Now, during uh, this period of time, uh, it was very well known for its purple dye works. And what's interesting about its history was there was a prophecy, and I have a handout on that, um, and it's a prophecy of Tyre, and that comes out of Ezekiel 26, which um, would have been written uh, probably about... Um, 550 BC talking about Tyre and talking about how it would be destroyed and literally how the city would be scraped and how they would literally lay their fishing nets out on the rocks, rock. And uh, it talks about how Nebuchadnezzar would come and destroy the city. And um, what what is what they had done, not only did Alexander come and destroy the city, just like the prophecy had said he would, but they had also uh, had part of the town on it's about half a mile out into the water but it also was like on a little island there and it was tire the city and it was just impenetrable i mean nobody could conquer it you know um even uh, nebuchadnezzar you know he he gave up on that part getting the one that was out in the water but then alexander the great came along and in 332 uh he then built a bridge or a mole out to that city he actually completely took the rubble from the old city and filled in like a causeway and then he then went out there and conquered that city and so today you can people literally do spread their fishing nets out over that area just exactly what that prophecy said uh, I just wanted to bring that up because I love prophecy and I love uh, archaeology and just uh, how all of it just works together how the Bible just is uh, God's holy word and we can just uh, be a and an amazement of it. So I wanted to bring that out about Tyre. Uh, here's a few pictures here. This is some Roman columns that would have been found in the area of Tyre. Well, in verse 4, we see that they find in some disciples. We stayed there seven days, and we do not have a record of uh, Paul necessarily uh, heading or staying in Tyre at any point in time, but we do know he passed through that area. So the church of Tyre was probably founded as a result of the dispersal of the Jer Jerusalem Hellenists following the martyrdom of Stephen. If you recall that verse in Acts eleven nineteen, where it says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen. Now this is very early in um, the the days right around 32 um, AD this is right after the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and and as you recall the the early church there was right there in Jerusalem and they they had seven um, men that they selected as deacons well Stephen was one of them and he was preaching and and he was preaching to the Sanhedrin and the Jewish council and the priest and and showing them out of the scripture how Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies and that how there is salvation only in Christ and well he ended up being stoned in Acts chapter 7 but from that point there was a great persecution and many people fled from Jerusalem at that point and this is very possibly possibly when uh, a possibility of where they then uh, went and shared the gospel wherever it says they went everywhere preaching the word is what it says well in verse 4 on it's very specific it says I'm finding disciples we stayed there seven days on their entire and it says they told Paul through the spirit not to go to Jerusalem okay so I just want us to think about this verse for just a minute um, Tyre <clears throat> was not the first place in which indications of this kind had been given him by what lay in store for him at Jerusalem. Um, and we had seen that earlier in chapter 20, where he, he, when he was talking to the Ephesian elders, he said, I, I'm just telling you that in every place I go, they're warning me of the chains and the tribulation that are going to come to me uh, when I go to Jerusalem. So this was not new. Um, it should not be concluded that his determination to go on was disobedience to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So it says it, it was under the constraint of that spirit that he was bound for Jerusalem with such determination. And there are some verses there for you as well. It was natural that his friends would, by the prophetic spirit, were able to foresee his tribulation and imprisonment and should try to dissuade him from going on. But with a complete lack of concern for his own safety, so long as he could fulfill his sacred stewardship Paul, like his master, which of course would be Jesus, set his face to go to Jerusalem. And that is coming out of Luke 9, 51. That is a verse that is referring to Jesus, how he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Well, we see Paul doing the same thing. Now in verses five through six, <clears throat> it says that they knelt down on the shore and they prayed. <clears throat> 
So I want you to think about what a picture of fellowship is that we have in Christ. Now, even though Paul probably did not know these disciples that well from the, at the very beginning, now they are and their families are accompanying Paul and his group in order to see them off. And it's just such a picture of the strong bond that we have with other believers through our faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, remember, that was one of the things I wanted you to watch for throughout this study, just how the beautiful body of Christ works together and how we encourage one another and we pray for one another. So um, they minister to one another. And Marita writes this, when you become a Christian, you not only into, enter into a new relationship with God through Jesus, but you also enter into new relationships with other believers. Well, as we have continue on, we see that just in this chapter, we will find we will see Paul fellowshipping with the believers in Tyre, in Ptolemaeus, in Caesarea, and finally in the home of Mason of Cyprus of Jerusalem. And that's not a misspelling of his name. That is the way it is spelled in the scripture. And I pronounce it Mason of Cyprus, who was uh, an early disciple. Was disciple will find out later, and he, he is at Jerusalem. So we see this hospitality all in all of these places wherever they find believers. Well, let's let's look at the next set of verses, okay? In Caesarea, so we're going to make our way to Caesarea, Agabus the prophet warned Paul again of the trials and the tribulation that would await him at Jerusalem. So those are verses 7 through 16. And we read this. It says, And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus, Ptolemaeus and greeted the brethren and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we, we who were uh, Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now remember, the seven that they're referring to are the seven deacons that would have been in the early church. Now this man, talking about Philip, had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And that note that as well, that any time you're leaving Jerusalem and Judea, you're always going down. So, um, so it says, um, and he came to us and he took hold, it says, um, and bound his, uh, Paul's belt and bound his own hands and feet and said, this, thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, "Why do you mean? Why do you mean? What do you mean by by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus." So, when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, "The will of the Lord be done." And then he goes on, he says, And after those days we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them one Mason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. Oh, so Paul and his team now, they are headed to Jerusalem, and we see that they're going to, to uh, spend a night in Ptolemaeus, and then they're going to get to Caesarea. So, Let's look at Ptolemaeus for just a minute. Verse 7 says, And we came to Ptolemaeus, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. Now, that jaunt from Tyre to Ptolemaeus was, was very short. As you can see it there on the map, it's only about 30 miles. Okay? And um, so the, their one-day stay with the believers, probably it's because they were on the ship's schedule. And it echoes back to the coming of the gospel to Phoenicia, from, probably from Stephen's persecution that arose after he was uh, killed. As well as Paul and Barnabas, if you remember, when they were coming down to Jerusalem, um, actually up to Jerusalem, uh, it would have been for the Jerusalem Council. It talks about, that would have been Acts 15, it talks about that how they went through this area and how they shared the gospel on their way up to Jerusalem. So I want to just show you a few pictures of Ptolemaeus. Ptolemaeus, uh, these are taken from uh, Dr. Stevens. Uh, most of them are. And so he would have been right there taking those himself. Um, this is what it looks like, the port city, the fortress ruins. Here's another picture of, you can almost just see the water splashing uh, like you're just standing right there, huh? All right, those were all taken by pictures as he and his wife, Jean, traveled through that area. 
Then it says in verse 8 that when they came to Caesarea and they entered the house of Philip the Evangelist. This is the first time in the book of Acts that Philip is referred to as the Evangelist. Now you remember he was one of the seven. Uh, his name is first mentioned when the church was choosing the deacons who would watch over the dispersion of the food between the Hellenist widows as well as the uh, Hebrew widows. And you also remember that in Acts 8 it talks about how he went to Samaria and witnessed to the Samaritans. And then it it says that the Holy Spirit told him to go down to a road uh, that was headed toward Gaza to the south. And you remember there is uh, the story of him encountering the Ethiopian eunuch who was headed back from Jerusalem and was going back to Ethiopia. And um, Philip then shared the gospel with him. He was gloriously saved. He was baptized. And then the Bible says that the Spirit caught Philip up and he was found in Astos. And I just wanted to read this verse to you where it talks about um, they when they had come up. Oh, let me show you some pictures too. Harbor uh, at Caesarea. So this is where they're coming, coming into. This is their harbor. This is the maritime. Now this is the Hippodrome. And we actually got to see that when we were in Caesarea. All right. And... Uh, Dr. Stevens saw this picture, and if you look at that, that is from the first century. That's called that's a boat ring, and that's where they would throw the rope for the boat around that, that would anchor it and dock it there, so that it couldn't uh, float away. And and these steps that you see right there, I got to see them when when we were there. Those are the steps that go down from the upper concourse down to the boat dock. So Paul no doubt went down those very steps right there in order to uh, get on the boat, get off the boat. And that, that's, they have, a, of course, a theater there. And uh, that's when we got to go there. I had such a good time. That's uh, my brother and his wife and with Mark and I. <clears throat> we also saw, this is one of my pictures, the, the Hippodrome. And this is an area where they would run the horses, they would run the chariots. It was kind of like an oblong, and it was very beautiful. You would sit in the stands, the horses would run, and you would look out over the Mediterranean Ocean. It was a beautiful sight. And this, we got to see this as well. This is where the, um, the air, air, uh, air, air, aerostatic, uh, uh, Er, I'm trying to pronounce that word, uh, but the rulers, uh, aristocratic maybe seating, this is where they would sit, and as you can see, it's raised up a little bit, and they are, uh, it's in an area where they would have the perfect view, right at the center of the Hippodrome, right there where the horses would run, and so that is where, no doubt, Herod Agrippa I, probably Herod Antipas, Pilate, all of them had sat right there at some point in time. As a matter of fact, they even have found a um, stone. Now this is a reproduction of it because the real thing would be in the museum, but uh, I got to see this as well, but this you can make out Pilate's name on there and uh, talking about Pontius Pilate. Mm -hmm. Well, the last mention of Philip, like I said, is uh, at that Acts 840 where he is then uh, coming up out of the water after he baptized the uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, and it says that Philip was founded as a toss, and from there it says he passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Well, that's where we are, and so sure enough, that's where he's still at, uh, and so um, they are going to, to lodge with him. Now, it says in verse 9 that he has four virgin daughters who prophesied. Now, if you recall, that is exactly what Joel prophesied would happen in the latter days. Paul Peter is going to quote that verse out of Joel in his Pentecost sermon in Acts 2, which would have been 25 years earlier. And this was the verse, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And so several years um, later, Philip and his daughters, just as a part of history, just so that you will know what the early church records records what they had done uh, and where they 
ended up, it says that he and his daughters uh, with some other Christians migrated to the province of Asia and spent their remaining days there. The tombs of Philip and of at least two of his daughters were pointed out at Hierapolis in Lycus Valley toward the end of the second century. The daughters, or at least some of them, lived to a great age and were highly esteemed as informants on persons and events belonging to the early years of Judean Christianity. <clears throat> so they were able to they they were able to be eyewitnesses and to tell the stories of the early days of Christianity, and they uh, were buried there in Hierapolis. And remember, that was over, looking over the beautiful Lycus Valley, where there was a Colossae and Laodicea and Hi Hierapolis as well. Well, they were there, and. Agabus comes, and Agabus, it says in verses 10 and 11, a certain Agabus. Now, remember in Acts 11, we recall that it was Agabus who came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and he prophesied about the famine that would happen during the days of Emperor Claudius. And that, as a matter of fact, at the end of chapter 11, we see Paul and Barnabas bringing famine relief to Jerusalem because of this famine that was happening. But again, Agabus, we saw his name earlier. Uh, also, I want you to notice that it says there uh, that when it says, thus, sayest, thus says the Holy Spirit, that that terminology is very reminiscent of the Old Testament prophets where they would have said, thus saith the Lord. So, but unlike the uh, Ty Tyrian Christians who spoke through the Spirit, Agabus does not draw the corollary that Paul ought not to continue his journey. The mode of his prophecy is reminiscent of much Old Testament prophecy. It is conveyed in action as well as in word. And we see that uh, there's several times in the Old Testament where you see that the word of the Lord, that the prophets actually acted it out. Uh, Hijah, for an example, he he was he tore his clothes uh, cloak, it says, to show that Solomon's kingdom would, would be disrupted. That's out of 1 Kings 11. Ezekiel, um, he mimicked the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem by laying siege himself to a replica of the city and that's in Ezekiel chapter 4 so they would actually act out the prophecy that they were prophesying and so we see here that Agabus foretold the binding of Paul by tying himself up with Paul's belt and uh, saying that whoever owns this belt uh, is going to be tied up and delivered over to um, going to be tied with chains and delivered over to the Gentiles well in verse 13 Paul answers and says what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart for I am ready not only to be bound but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ so you see that Paul was ready to die for the cause of the gospel and it says this this warning that he has from Agabus this is the last warning we're going to see this is the last time Paul's going to be warned um, and, and think about this he's in Caesarea the next stop is Jerusalem and so he was willing to be bound and even to die at Jerusalem um, so I just had a question for you this was one of the questions I asked you to watch for earlier and that's answering the question why would Paul continue on to Jerusalem and in studying his letters we can see why we can see why and um, if you think about it, the, the, he, he said this to the Ephesian elders when he said, I, I'm just being told everywhere I go that when I get to Jerusalem, chains and tribulation are, are waiting for me there. But I want you to think about this. He is fully surrendered unto what the Lord Jesus, unto the Lord Jesus, and did not hold his life dear unto himself. This is what he said in Acts 20, 24 to the Ephesian elders. He said, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear unto myself, that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So he said, I do not hold my life dear unto myself. Well, I think another reason as well is that he loved his fellow Jews, regardless of the fact that they had persecuted him in every city that he had gone just about, he desired for them to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is what he had just written just a few months earlier to the Christians in Rome. Listen to this talking about his love for his brethren. He says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. And what he means by like that is 
fellow Jews who are Israelites to whom pertain and these are all the things that that the scriptures bear witness that God did with with this group of people the Israelites he says who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption the glory the covenants the giving of the law the service of God and the promises to whom are the fathers and from whom according to the flesh Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God amen and so we see there, he had such a love for his brothers. And he says that Israel had stumbled at the stumbling stone, which is Jesus. Um, further in that chapter, Romans 9, he would say, What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. And then he quotes this verse because it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Again, a former prophecy of concerning Jesus Christ. And he says, For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, and that stone it was Christ. Well, we ask the question, what was Paul's heart's desire for his fellow Jews? Very simply, Romans 10, 1, my heart's desire, brethren, and my prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Yep, that's, that's, this is explaining why he wanted to go to Jerusalem. Well, if he was asked the question, well, has God cast away your people? I mean, is he done with Israel? Is he, has everything turned now to the believers and, and he just doesn't have any more use for Israel? This is what Paul's answer was to that. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Well, then Paul goes on and he explains. He says, he says, even at the present time, he said, even now, there is an election of the Jews according to grace. And if you think about it, all of the early disciples, they were Jewish. And that's what Paul said, even at the present time, there is an election of the Jews according to grace. And in 11, Romans 11, 5 through 7, he says these words, even at the present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So Paul says it's a mystery. It is a mystery, but here is why the Israelites have been blinded. And this is what he says a little further down in Romans 11. He says, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part, here it is, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Well, I think the third reason, not only does he have such a love for his, his brethren according to the flesh, the Israelites, the Jews, but I think the love of Christ. He talks about how the love of Christ constrained him. He said his love for Christ compelled him to share Jesus. Look at this verse. These are all verses that he had already written. These are from the letters that he had already written. So we know at this point in time, that this this is has this has already been circulating out there for the love of Christ compels us he says because we just judge this that if one died for all then all died and and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again and that was the statement of his life. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And of course, the fourth reason is because he had this offering. He wanted to minister to the saints in Jerusalem. He was bringing this monetary gift that he had, had encouraged all the churches to give and to help with the saints uh, there in Jerusalem. And he writes that in Romans uh, 15, 25 through 28. He said, but now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, is what he says. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia, those are all the churches, 
where he's he's been to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. And he goes on, he says, it pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. And he's going to make this point that if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to, to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have per performed this and have sealed in to them this fruit, so Paul had this idea, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to seal this fruit. He says, I will go by way of you to Spain, meaning to Rome, to talk to the Romans. I'll go by way of you on my way to Spain. So his idea was to come to Jerusalem and to seal this fruit. And so we really do ask ourselves the, ourselves the question about people that are willing to go into the very face of danger when they're being warned, you do realize how dangerous this is, how they have this very same attitude that Paul did, that I am willing to be bound, I am willing to die in Jerusalem for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I have a list of several, several missionaries that the, their life story is exactly this case. Jim Elliott, David Livingstone, William Carey, Adoniram Judson, C.T. Studd, John Patton, and we talked about John Patton in, last, in the last lesson. I just want to mention one of them, William Carey. He, and he's known as the father of modern missions. That he, basically, uh, he was in Europe. He rose up in Europe and said to a group of ministers, he said, I am going to go to India and make the gospel known there. Now listen to this. A minister in the audience rebuked him. Sit down, young man. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen in India, he will do it without consulting you or me. But Carrie wouldn't be persuaded, and praise God, he wouldn't. And story after story of how they knew they were called by God to go to this place and to share the gospel and how they persevered. Well, as we go on in verse 14, we have seen where that when he would not be persuaded, Luke says, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. Luke has confidence in the sovereignty of God. God's will most certainly will be done. God will get Paul to Rome. Paul might arrive in chains, but God will get him there, Dr. Stevens writes. So then after 15, verse 15, after three days, after those days, I'm sorry, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Now this is going to be about a 64 mile trip from Caesarea to Jerusalem. And uh, you can see that there on the map uh, where it, we're talking about Caesarea to Jerusalem. Okay. And it probably took him two days to do that. Uh, I did want to bring out this historical note that the term that they use packed uh, for getting ready, and there's the Greek term there, is used by some ancient authors for saddling and packing horses for a trip. It may imply that the group made the 64-mile journey to Jerusalem on horseback. Well, on verse 16, it says, And also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain mason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. So that term early disciple, it means that he would, must have meant that he was saved earlier, perhaps in the days of the apostles when they were in Jerusalem. Um, and so he would have been one of the small minority of Hellenists who still remained in Jerusalem, the mother church, according to Bruce. Um, in his commentary on the book of Acts. So Paul had come to Jerusalem after um, his third journey to bring his nation alms and offerings from the Gentile churches, Acts 24, 17. Paul knew how much his unbelieving fellow countrymen hated him and how desperately they wanted him out of the way. He had been in danger from his own people more than once. And you can read about that in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six, and also verse 24. Evidently, Paul was hoping that the gift from the Gentiles to his nation would speak unmistakably to his brethren after the flesh of the universal grace of God and open their eyes to the inexpressible gift that is in Christ Jesus. Well, I want you to know this is going to be Paul's fifth, and it's going to be his final visit to Jerusalem. Okay, so as we look now at verses 17 through 19, we see that Paul does arrive in Jerusalem. He and his team are greeted by James and the elders of the Jerusalem church. And uh, let's read verses 17 through 19. And it says, And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. 
And on the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And when he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So Paul and his company are going to arrive in Jerusalem. And there is a map there. You see where they've traveled from Tyre to Ptolemais to Caesarea, and now they are in Jerusalem. No doubt they have made it in time for the Feast of Pentecost. Well, think about this. It says in verse 17, and when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Do you remember the prayer that Paul had asked the Roman church, the Roman believers to be praying for him? Well, God answered that prayer. I'll show you that prayer again. So he had written this probably about a year by now, uh, uh, prior to this, and look at that what I, that I have highlighted and underlined and read it. And he pr asked them to pray this, that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. And we just read that in verse 17, that they received Paul gladly. Um, Wow, that was, his, that was his prayer request. So this collection was very important to Paul. If you remember, Paul and Barnabas had brought money for famine relief to Jerusalem in AD 46 and met with the apostles, James, Peter, and John. They had been asked at that time, if you remember that, to remember the poor, the very thing Paul said that he was eager to do, and he wrote that in Galatians 2.10. And so Paul, throughout his missionary journeys, he had remembered the poor, and so he had this, this collection, and remember, Last time we didn't go through all the names, but there is a literally a delegate from just about every church that has been planted on his missionary journey. This is long a large entourage that comes with him, nine to eleven people. They are coming with Paul in order to oversee the the bringing in of this contribution. So Paul is now bringing a sizable collection from the Gentile churches with representatives from the various churches to present it to the leadership in Jerusalem. In Paul's eyes. It was the tangible fruit of the Aegean phase of his ministry, which was now completed. His ministry thus far would be sealed by the presentation of this fruit at Jerusalem. In a sense, if you think about it, the money collected might be called the offering of the Gentiles. The Gentile believers themselves as the offering which he himself is presenting to the priestly service of the gospel of God, Romans 15, 16. The collection for Jerusalem was but an outward and visible sign of this more sacred offering. Well, also do note this too in verse 18 we should point out that luke's a second we passage is coming to an end remember we have seen that throughout the book of acts that there are times when it's it's in the first person the pronoun we um and and so you realize that luke is actually with them well in verse 18 that terminology is going to end at this point um so just wanted to bring that out. Now, Paul, uh, it says in verse 18, went in with us, see again that terminology that Luke is there eyewitnessing what he's seeing, to James and all the elders were present. Now, I, I want to bring out that it says James and the elders. Well, this is interesting because if you think back to everything we've studied in Acts so far, that in the story of Acts, it started off with the apostles exclusively as the leaders of Messianic Israel. The number 12, for this very reason of their representative value, it says a new vision for the people of God. These apostles function exclusively as the leaders into Acts chapter 11. And we know that at Acts 10 and Acts 11, that is the story of Peter taking the gospel to Cornelius. Then we see the word elders. Elders, however, show up abruptly in the famine relief delivered to Bar by Barnabas and Saul, which is sent to the elders in Jerusalem. Not, it says, to the apostles necessarily, doesn't mention their name, but to the elders in Jerusalem. And so we pick up on that at about Acts 11, verse 1, and also verse 30. Well, this development notably occurs after Peter's Cornelius uh, instance where he shared the gospel with Cornelius that was opposed by, there was many of the conservative elements in the Jerusalem church. Remember how they challenged Peter and they said, you went into the home of a Gentile and ate with him. And then Peter recounted the whole story. Luke takes a lot of time in the book of Acts to cover 
that story of Peter taking the gospel to Cornelius, uh, two full chapters practically where he is covering this. And then when Peter recounted it for them, describing how he, everything was by either a, an angel of the Lord or the vision of God or the Holy Spirit moving uh, upon them, directing the whole thing that happened. And then the Holy Spirit falls, they begin to speak in tongues, Peter's like, who am I to withstand God? And it says that they, having heard that, they agreed and they acknowledged that it was this was God that 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 had saved the gospel has come to Cornelius and to the Gentiles. Well, after Acts 11 and and the situation with Cornelius and this gospel coming to Cornelius, the next time reference is made to the leadership in Jerusalem, the Jerusalem conference uh, provoked by the first missionary journey. And you're going to see where it mentions apostles and elders. And remember, Acts 15 was a story of the Jerusalem Council, and James really uh, begins to be the leader here. He, it is, he, he is the one who wrote the letter. He is the one who spoke uh, last after Peter had spoken and Barnabas had spoken and Paul had spoken, and he, he just summarizes what God is doing. And, um, and now this would be Jesus' half-brother. He would be the author of the book of James that we have in our New Testament. That is, throughout the book, uh, Acts 15, the apostles at the conference never are referred to exclusively after that point as an independent entity. And no doubt they are out sharing the gospel, going to the ends of the earth, taking the gospel. Well, James has been a member of the Jerusalem church from its beginning until his death in AD 62, a period of 31, th over 30, about 30 years. Over this 30 year period, the Jerusalem church became more conservatively Jewish First, the Hellenists immigrated in the 30s. Do you remember how many of the um, people were scattered after the persecution of Stephen? And by the late 40s, they were fall followed by Peter and possibly John and possibly the other apostles. The final glimpse of the Jerusalem church given by Acts at the time of Paul's final visit is a thoroughly, Jew a thoroughly Jewish enclave. So, uh, and you can see the reference there for that. Okay, so... As we go on, we see now in verse 19 that it says that when he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. Now, again, many of the representative, representatives of the Gentile churches were right there with Paul, and they were able to give witness and testimony to the truth of what Paul was saying, right? So James and the leaders, it says, praise God for his amazing grace and work among the Gentiles. Well, let's now look at verses 20 through 26, and we're going to see what happens next, okay? So following the Jerusalem leadership's advice, Paul agrees to join with four other Jewish men in fulfilling a vow at the temple, and we see that in Acts uh, chapter 21, verses 20 through 26. And it says, And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, talking about Paul, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they are informed concerning you are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written, and remember that was the Jerusalem Council he's talking about, the letter that they had written after the Jerusalem Council. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Well, then it says, Then Paul took them in, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. 
Wow, Paul, this is a picture of uh, the temple. And this is a, a rendition of what Jerusalem would have possibly looked like in the first century. So you see the temple there um, off to the right and toward the back, okay? So in verse 20, it says, you see, this is what they say. You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed and they are all zealous for the law. Do you pick up on any tension in that statement right there? You know, okay, so there's many, many Jews who have believed. Well, that's, that is awesome. That's great. And then he adds this, and they are zealous for the law. You know, if you're like me, you're expecting them to say, and they're zealous for Jesus Christ. But it says they're zealous for the law. Hmm. Well, if you recall just eight years earlier, that the reason for the Jerusalem Council was because there were certain men of Judea who taught the brethren at Antioch, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And then also it says in uh, just a few verses later in Acts 15, it says there was a sect of the Pharisees who, who had believed. It says who rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them, speaking of the Gentiles, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. It's, it, they were saying salvation through Christ and then after you're saved, you need to be circumcised, you need to keep the law of Moses. Well, you know the amazing summary of the Jerusalem Council after they came together and listened to Peter and Paul and Barnabas and James, that the conclusion was this, that the Jews and the Gentiles are saved the same way. They are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was the clear decision of the Jerusalem Council. And if you recall, Peter very clearly made this statement in Acts 15. We believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. That is a summary of their conclusion of what God is doing among the Gentiles and among the Jews, that they are all saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the law, if you think about the law, and as Paul has already written to the Romans, the law is fulfilled in Christ. Remember when Christ Jesus, he said that, you know, I think it's Matthew 5 or 6, where he says, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets, I came to fulfill it. Well, Christ, it says in Romans 10, 4, he is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So if you think about it, uh, it, it when you ask the question, well, can a Jewish believer in Jesus, uh, can you believe in Jesus and still observe the temple regulations and rituals at the same time? If you think about it, as long as you understand this, as long as you understand that you're saved by the blood and the grace of Jesus and that the observation of the temple regulations and rituals no wise contribute to your salvation. Your salvation was complete in Christ. Nothing can be added to him. If you think about it, I'm thinking back to Acts um, 2 and 3, and it talks about where Peter and John, they were going to the temple for, for the hour of prayer um, while they were there in Jerusalem. And then, of course, you know the story of where they were at the beautiful gate and they healed the lame man. And so they were going to the temple to pray, but they understood that none of those things added to their salvation. As a matter of fact, the book of Hebrews, that's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. It shows the superiority of Christ in all other areas, whether you're talking about the sacrifices, the blood, the priestly office, Moses. I mean, what? All of, all of the temple rituals point to Christ. Well, Stephen picks up on this tension between these two statements. He says the Jews who have believed and they're zealous for the law. So he says, he writes this, law observant Jews would be one matter, but zealous for the law? What about the Jesus tradition? What about the Jesus tradition would make one zealous for the law? Such zeal could mean only one truth. Stephen has not been heard in the Jerusalem church. And what he's referring to is he's going back to when Stephen stood before the entire Jewish authority, all the elders, the Sanhedrin, all of them, and preached the gospel to them. And so, and of course he was martyred and persecution arose and that would have been 25 years earlier, 24 years earlier. It says, it can only mean one thing. They, they hadn't heard what Stephen was saying to the Jerusalem church or if heard, dismissed. Stephen had made clear Jesus transcended Moses by cutting a new covenant that rendered the law and the temple obsolete. That was a message. That was the point of his message. 
that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all of the law and all of the prophets. Well, in the next few verses, we see where the Jerusalem leadership requested of Paul to observe a purification rite in the temple with fellow Jewish believers in order to smooth over hard feelings that the Jews in Jerusalem felt toward Paul based upon what they had been hearing about him. Um, and now this vow, if you remember at the end of Paul's second missionary journey, do you remember when he left Corinth, stopped at Ephesus very briefly, and left Aquila and Priscilla there? It says that he had a hurry to get to Jerusalem because he had taken a vow. He had had, uh, he planned to go, he had made a, a vow of some kind, a Nazareth vow, but he needed to get to the temple. He needed to get to Jerusalem. So it, it, this is Paul talking about. So we're going to see that, that he does agree to do this, all right? Well, uh, it says now in the next verse, I thought that was a really good picture of just, you can just kind of see the, the Jewish elders just talking with Paul. It says in verse 21, it says this, it says, but they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. So I want you to notice several things about that statement, okay? So let's ask ourselves the questions, okay? This statement where it says, they've been informed that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Well, you know that Paul did not spend a whole lot of time teaching the Jews on the three missionary journeys. Why? Well, remember how many times, remember the chart that we had, and I'll show it to you in just a minute, how many places that Paul had been persecuted by the fellow Jews every time he went to the synagogue? Remember Thessalonica, he was there for three weeks before they said, you have to leave. And Ephesus, he did get to stay for three months. But we saw this. Look at, look at the list of these towns. He was plotted against by his own countrymen in Damascus, in Pisidia of Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra, in Thessalonica, in Berea, in Corinth, in Ephesus, and in Greece, in, in Corinth, in chapter 20. So, um, okay, so that statement you have to just kind of kind of look at and say, okay. Well, the second thing, do you, do you, is there any record anywhere on the journeys of Paul uh, that he that that he makes this statement that anywhere in in that we've seen so far that he makes this statement that Jews who are among the Gentiles are to forsake Moses by not circumcising their children or walk according to the customs well the answer to that is no and if we look at the, uh, he preaches the gospel, and they can come to that conclusion, but I'll show that to you in just a minute, because we're going to look at what he has written, okay? So, the one sermon that we do have that's recorded so far in Acts was when Paul was addressing the Jewish people and the god fears on that very first missionary journey. If you remember that, he was in the city of Antioch of Pisidia, and that's, this is what he preached, a wonderful sermon. If you get a chance to read that, that whole sermon over through that again, Acts 13, just amazing. He quotes a lot of Old Testament scripture. He just shows them again how Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Well, look at this, the, these verses here. When it talks about, he goes through it. He says, I bring you glad tidings, the promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, and that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm. So now he's quoting scripture. You are my son. Today I've begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. Just talking about Jesus. He says, he's spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another Psalms, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was buried with the fathers and saw corruption. But he who God raised up from the dead saw no corruption. Then he makes this statement, therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, Everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So that is the gospel. He wrote clearly in the Galatians, the very first letter he wrote, he says the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. That's what he said, that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. 
Well, when you look at some of the other things, this is what he taught about circumcision and keeping the law. Now, this is what I'm taking this from is the letters that he has written. So what did he say about circumcision? Well, we see that in Galatians 5, 4 through 6, where he says, you have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. Now, you remember the situation at Galatia and where they had been saved and believed the gospel and then the Judaizers had come in behind them and said, oh, but wait, you got to be circumcised. You got to keep for your salvation to be complete. We need to add a little bit to it and we need for you to observe the law and we need for you to be circumcised. And you remember Paul's <laughs> response to them in the book of Galatia where he says, if if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what I have preached to you, let him be accursed. He said, if an angel from heaven preaches or anything preaches any, even I preach any other gospel to you than what I have preached to you, let him be accursed. And so we know very clearly there is nothing that can be added to salvation that is in Christ Jesus. And so in Galatians 5 through 6, he says, you become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law. So they had believed in Christ, but now they were saying, well, I guess I need to go back to the law and I need to go back in under the law to make sure. And, and he said, you become estranged from Christ. He said, for we through the spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. You see, it's through the spirit. It's by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. But here it is, faith working through love. So this is what he taught. And in Galatians 6, 14 through 16, he says, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He says, For in Christ Jesus, here he says it again, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Well, talking about the works of the law, I mean, he had written this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For the, by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So that is what he was teaching. That is what the gospel is. In Galatians 3.11, he says this as well, but, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. He says it again. Well, in Romans, we know this wonderful verse out of Romans where it talks, I am this really the center verse of the book of Romans. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. He says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Also, Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And Romans 8, 3 through 4, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So there you have it. These are the things he had written, and so that is why they were saying what they were saying. Bruce summarizes it like this. It was freely rumored in Jerusalem that Paul not only refused to impose the requirements of the Jewish law on the Gentile converts. Now you think about it, that's what the Jerusalem decree had decided. Remember that? Uh, but he actually dissuaded Jewish believers, it was said, from continuing to practice their ancestral customs handed down from Moses. He even encouraged them to give up circumcising their sons. That's what was, was said of him. Well, Paul's position in that, in such matters, is very clear from his letters. The circumcising of gentle con converts as a kind of insurance policy, policy, lest faith in Christ should be insufficient in itself, he denounced as a departure from the purity of the gospel. Galatians 5, 2 through 4. And this is my note in there. Just do you remember how Paul refused to have Titus allow him, them to, to, for Titus to be circumcised who was a Greek because it was a salvation issue in that particular situation you read about it in Galatians 2, uh, 1 through 4. But in, um, Bruce continues, but in itself, circumcision was a matter of indifference. It made no difference to one's status in God's sight. And there are those verses there. And, and I just brought out this point as well, that do you remember how Paul did have Timothy circumcised uh, in Lystra? Because Timothy was going to go uh, on the journeys with him. And so again, it was, it was, a, it was made no difference. 
Paul adopted the same flexible attitude to such customs as observ observance of special days or abstention from certain kinds of foods. Let everyone be fully convinced in his own mind, Romans 14, 2 through 6. Now, this is what he had already written. He himself was happy to conform to Jewish customs when he found himself in Jewish society, but he had learned to be equally happy to conform to Gentile ways in Gentile company. Well, verse 22. It says, what then? This is what they said. The assembly most will certainly meet and they will hear that you have come. So James and the Jerusalem elders, they came up with a plan. And it, they, you can see how they were in a difficult situation. On the one hand, they're in agreement with Paul theologically and they want to affirm his work among the Gentiles. On the other, they want to continue to reach Jerusalem and the Judean Jews with the gospel of Christ and not give a cause for deeper division within the Jerusalem church. So you can see now in verses 23, through 24, it says, we'll tell you what to do. We have four men who've taken a vow. Take them, be purified with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they are informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself walk orderly and according to the law. Well, Raymond writes this. He says, I do not intend to suggest that James was personally apprehensive about Paul, but there can be little doubt either that for James, as the leader of the Jewish church in Jerusalem, Paul Paul's missionary labors had raised acute difficulties for relationships between the Messianic Jewish community and the wider Jewish community in Jerusalem and Judea at a time of rapidly increasing religious nationalism. He goes on, he says, apparently he approved of, well, he certainly did not raise an objection to the elder's suggestion that Paul participate in and bear the expense of the rite of purification, which four Jewish Christians had undertaken in order that in their words, everyone will know that there is no truth in these reports concerning you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. Uh, verse 24, because Paul was willing to become all things to all men, he that he may by all means save some. First Corinthians 9, 22, he submitted him. He had written that because he had written, he had written the letter to the Corinthians in First Corinthians. He submitted himself to the advice of the Jerusalem leadership and entered into a week-long ceremonial rite of purification, which necessarily required his presence at the temple. So in verse 25, they recount the decision of the Jerusalem council. You see that where they recount that. And then in verse 26, it says that Paul then took the men the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now, this was quite expensive for Paul to take on this responsibility. Uh, the completion, this is a, another picture of how massive the, the temple mount area was. Would have looked I think it is right at really close to like 40 acres altogether well the completion of a Nazarite vow consisted of an offering of a year old male lamb a year old ewe lamb a ram a basket of bread and various grain and drink offerings you can read that in number 6 14 through 17 these offerings resulted in a considerable expense to the Nazarite Paul's willingness to support the Nazarites and to undertake the purification rites himself illustrates his principle of becoming all things to all men for the sake of the gospel. Well, just as prophesied, Paul is bound and arrested when he went into the temple. In verses 27 through 30, we read these words to where it says, um, and when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law in this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. 
And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. There's something final about those last few words, isn't it, where it says that the doors were shut. Well, we see here that when these seven days were almost finished, they were almost ended. Well, here is a picture of the temple, and it's labeled there so you can see where the temple building is. You can see where the court of the Gentiles is. That would be the outer court. And then you can see also, remember we talked about the balustrade, which was the fence that had the inscriptions that forbade anyone who was a Gentile to go past that point. Now, uh, the court of women, as you can see there in that uh, aqua color, was a little bit closer. And then the court for the Israelite men would have been actually a little bit closer inside that second gate, uh, the canner gate. They could have gone through that. I'll show you that in just a minute. Well, in verse 27, it says the seven days were almost ended. Paul's purificatory process lasted for seven days. There was a special ceremony of purification on the third day and the seventh day. He had practically completed all that was required of him when the riot broke out in the temple courts. And uh, so we see there that it, it says there that some of the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. Now, among the, the Jews of the dispersion, there, there, those of the province of Asia were particularly hostile to Paul. He had incurred their enmity during his years of ministry in Ephesus. You remember the riot that happened in the theater there at Ephesus under Demetrius? Well, among the Gentile friends who had come with Paul to Jerusalem was the Ephesian Trophimus, whom these Asian Jews recognized when they saw him in Paul's company. When they were out, when Paul was probably walking around in Jerusalem, they saw him. Well, once they saw Paul again in the temple, they immediately assumed that he had brought in this Trophimus inside that balustrade past the point where the Gentiles were not allowed to go. Well, in verse 28, it says, it says, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. That was their accusation, which was completely false. So the court of the Gentiles, that was uh, the court of Israel, I'm sorry, was the area of the inner precincts of which the Jewish men who were not priests or Levites were admitted. And uh, I'll show you, this is a picture right here, a, a good map of the, what the Temple Mount would have looked like. And again, I want to show you where uh, they would have been allowed to go. Do you see that? It says the Israelite courtyard. Well, the men would have been able to go, just the Israelite men would have got, been able to come a little bit closer to the Temple and then that is the gate right there that they could go through right there at the gate of Nicanor. There were actually steps uh, leading up to that gate that they would recite uh, psalms as the priests, as they would uh, make beautiful music, and they would recite many of the psalms as they take one step at a time. It's called the Psalm of Ascension, and we see that in the Bible. Uh, then also there is this gate, and they believe that is where the gate beautiful is located, and uh, so anyone Jewish could come in through this point. Uh, but these were the gates, as you can see where the arrows are going. This is where the balustrade was, and this was the opening that the Jewish people would walk through, but the Gentile people could not pass that point right there. And uh, if you, there is a picture looking down upon what the temple, this is a model in Jerusalem. Well, this is a capital offense. Everybody understood that. The Gentiles might visit the outer court of the temple, which for this reason was sometimes called the court of the Gentiles, but they were forbidden to penetrate any of the inner courts on pain of death. The Roman authorities were so conciliatory of Jewish religious scruples in this regard that they authorized the death sentence for this trespass even when the offenders were Roman citizens. Think about that, that no Gentile might unwittingly enter into the forbidden areas. Notices in Greek and Latin were fixed to the barrier separating them from the outer court, warning the Gentiles that death was the penalty for further ingress. As you recall from the last PowerPoint last week, uh, we, you were able to see this. They have found several of these stones that have this inscription written on it, which basically says no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Anyone who is caught trespassing will bear personal responsibility for his own ensuing death. Well, in verse 29, they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, which they supposed Paul brought into the temple. Now, 
If you think about it, if the Asian Jews charge against Paul had been justified, he would certainly have been guilty of aiding and abetting and indeed participating in a most serious crime against Jewish law and one which was bound immediately to aflame all the Jews of Jerusalem against him. Well, the Asian Jews were well aware of this when they raised a hue and a cry against him. This man, they shouted, not content with the attacks of the, on the Jewish people, law and the sanctuary which he had made in his teaching all over the world. This accusation strongly was reminiscent of the charge against Stephen had actually profaned the holy place by bringing Greeks into it. So they're saying Paul has not only spoken out against the Jewish people and the law and the sanctuary, but he has profaned the holy place and he has brought Greeks into it. And again, very reminiscent of the accusations that were brought against Stephen probably 23 years earlier. Well, in verse 30, we see immediately the doors were shut. And for Luke himself, there must this, this may have been the very, very moment when the Jerusalem temple ceased to, to fulfill the honorable role hitherto ascribed to in his twofold history. The exclusion of God's message and messenger from this house, once called by his name, sealed its doom. It was now ripe for the destruction, which Jesus had predicted for many years before in Luke 21, 6. You read these words, and Jesus had said this when asked about the end times. He said, these things which you see, and talking about the temple, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so it is within 12 years, the temple would be burnt to the ground. Well, I just want you to think about for a minute and think about what false accusations, how much damage they do. Here is the story of Paul is an example of false accusation. And I want you to think about the one that endured the most in terms of false accusations. You know, the Bible says that there are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. This is out of Proverbs chapter six. And it talks about how the Lord hates a proud look and a lying tongue. And it says he hates hands that shed innocent blood and a heart that devises wicked scheme, schemes. And then he talks about feet that are swift and running to evil. And he talks about a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among brethren. So three out of the seven things that Proverbs 6 says that the Lord hates have to do with the tongue, either a false witness or a lying tongue or someone who is sowing discord among brethren. Well, the 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 this false accusation that they had said of Paul right here, where they said, oh, he's brought someone past the balustrade. He has brought him into the temple and he has defiled this holy place. All of it not true. Well, I thought of Jesus. And if you think about the night that Jesus was betrayed by the kiss of Judas, he was brought before Caiaphas, the high priest. And it says in the scripture that they tried to find false witnesses against Jesus in order to accuse him. It says that, and Peter was following Jesus at a distance uh, in the high priest's courtyard. And now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false testimony against Jesus. They were seeking someone that would give false testimony about Jesus and to put him to death. But they, it says they found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against, against you? But Jesus kept silent. And then the high priest said to him, he said, I adjure you, he said, I put you under an oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Okay? Well, it was at that point that Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, the response that the high priest had, had to that was he tore his clothes, it says. He tore his clothes saying, he's spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. What do you think? And they all answered and said, he is deserving of death. Then they spat on in his face and they beat him and others struck him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is it that struck you? 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record that the charges against Jesus by the high priest was blasphemy because he said he was the Christ, the Son of God. And we have just read that in Matthew. Mark says it like this, where the high priest says to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus answered, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need have we of witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they said, He is deserving of death. Luke, same thing happens. But it says both the chief priests and the scribes, they came together and they led him into their council saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. And he said to them, If I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I also ask you, and if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? And he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And then they said, What further testimony do we have? We've heard it ourselves out of his own mouth. And John records it like this, that when the chief priests and the officers saw him, that they cried out, this is before Pilate, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said, you take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. And this is what the Jews said. We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die. And here it is, because he made himself the Son of God. So all four gospel writers record that the charge brought against Jesus by the high priest was blasphemy because he said he was the Christ, the Son of God. Well, the Jews then tell Pilate that according to their law that Jesus ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. But in order to get Pilate to crucify Jesus, they had to turn this into a political charge, namely that he was the king of the Jews. I want you to look at this out of Luke 23, and you can also read it in Matthew 27 in those verses that I've referenced there. And when the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate, and they began to accuse him. Now look at when they bring him to Pilate, this is what they say to Pilate, okay? We found this person, look at the political emphasis that they're trying to get Pilate to give the authorization for him to be crucified. We found this person, fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, just false accusations right here, saying, but this is true, that he himself is Christ, a king. Now you see how they turn it so that, that, that a Pilate is going to have to respond that he is the Christ, meaning he is a king. And that then affects Pilate's realm. Then Pilate asked him, you, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered and said to him, it is as you say. Well, John adds these details to the conversation between Jesus and Pilate. Uh, Pilate goes into the praetorium and, and he asked Jesus and called to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this or did others tell you concerning me? And Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And after he said this, he went out to the Jews. And do you know what he said to them? I find no fault in him at all. I want you to know that Luke and John both record that Pilate said three times, I find no fault in this man. Matthew also records Pilate saying about Jesus that he is a just man. Pilate, it says that he tried to wash his hands. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of what? Of this just person you see to it. Matthew and Mark record that Pilate knew that they had delivered Jesus up because of envy. Well, here is what finalized Pilate's decision to have Jesus crucified. I want you to listen to this, what they said. Listen to what the Jews said to him, all right? John 19, 12 through 16. And then, on Pilate, then from then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. 
And that's what sealed it. When Pilate heard this saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold your king. And they all cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said, shall I crucify your king? And listen to what the chief priest said. We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. This is the area of the Gabbatha. And we actually got to go there when we were in Israel. Pilate heard the saying. He brought Jesus down to the judgment seat and sat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And there you can actually see uh, the spot where Jesus would have stood before Pilate. It's under that glass uh, lighted area, very protected. That is a close up picture that we had taken of that spot. So that is the spot where they would literally have stood Christ. It's still engraved in the stone. That's a closer up issue, picture of it. And those are the verses I just read. We have no king but Caesar, they said. And this is as you're leaving that area, you see that they have a painting. And this is where then it says that they led him away to be crucified. Well, the last verses. Paul's rescued by the Roman commander of the garrison. Verses 31 through 36. It says that now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. And he immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. And when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. And when he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. And the multitude of the people followed after him, crying away with him. And as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, uh, may I speak to you? And he said, can you speak Greek? So we will cover those verses in just a minute. But here's what I want you to say. The news came to the commander of the garrison that all of Jerusalem was in an uproar. And as you see here, we know that, that the commander of the tribune would have been located at the fortress of Antonia. This fortress was built right next to the northwestern corner of the Temple Mount. And you, I have it highlighted there. This is the Temple Mount. That is the fortress of Antonio. So its purpose was to station the troops located in Jerusalem for the keeping of peace. Josephus informs us that a Roman cohort was always stationed at the fortress of Antonia, and at the festivals, they extended along the colonnades, fully armed and watching for any signs of popular discontentment. It says a cohort consisted of 760 infantry troops and 240 cavalry. Now I want you to know that it had four towers and uh, from which the Roman soldiers could look down upon everything that was happening in the temple area. Well, no doubt that, you know, the Jews did not like that at all. Now, if you notice, three of the towers reached 75 feet tall, but a fourth one, the one that was closest to the temple, you can see that it is 100 feet high. So it could clearly see everything that was going on inside the temple. So they resented that greatly, but there's nothing they could do about it. Well, in verse 32, it says he immediately took the soldiers and the centurions and ran down to them. If Paul had not been rescued by Claudius Lysia, now we know his name from uh, the next chapter, the Roman guards that, that were stationed at the fortress of Antonia, he would have been killed. But uh, this public disturbance, you can see that uh, that they kept, they wouldn't, it was not tolerated by Rome whatsoever, especially near a feast time at Pentecost. So we see here that all of Jerusalem is in an uproar. He had to act quickly and he had to act decisively. And when it says centurions, that's in plural, so very possibly there was at least two of them. And as we know, a centurion was in charge of a hundred men. Well, Paul then, is rescued. It says that the commander came near 
and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. That is exactly what Agabus had said would be happen. Remember in, in chapter 21, verse 11, he's Agabus took Paul's belt and bound his hands and feet, says, thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Well, Paul then gives his testimony to, uh, when he gave, gives his testimony to Herod Agrippa, and this is going to be further in Acts 24, he is retelling this event, and he refers to this event as saying that he obtained help from God. So Paul saw, no doubt, the coming of these Roman uh, centurions and tribunes to come to, to his aid as help from God. Well, when he reached the top of the stairs, it says that he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. The commander ordered Paul to be taken into the fortress because he could not ascertain who Paul was or what he had done. And so the shout, away with him, away with him. And doesn't that not sound very similar to where on that very spot, 25 years earlier, the mob had cried that very same thing after another man by the name of Jesus away with him, crucify him. So Paul requests to speak to the crowd and the commander gives him permission. And I've uh, already read one of those verses and I'll continue. It says, and Paul, uh, he was led, may I speak? He says, and he says, can you speak Greek? And he says, are you not the Egyptian who some time ago raised an insurrection and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood at the stairs and motioning with his hand to the people. And when there was great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language saying, and we will take that up next week. But as we close here, he asked him, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago raised an insurrection and led 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Well, the, the, historically, we know that that is exactly what happened when in saying that the Egyptian led them out into the wilderness. The tribune may be grouping him with other imposters who at this time did lead their dupes out into the wilderness of Judea, promising to perform miracles there. As a matter of fact, Jesus had said uh, 25 years early, he said, false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. And so Josephus writes about this Egyptian insurrectionist, and um, it says that, that about three years prior to this time, there was an Egyptian adventurer who appeared in Jerusalem. He claimed to be a prophet, and he led a large band of followers out to the Mount of Olives. There he told them to wait until at his word of command, the walls of the city would fall flat. Then they would march in and overthrow the Roman garrison and take possession of the place, but Felix, the procurator at Judea, sent a body of troops against him. They killed several and took others prisoner. The Egyptian himself discreetly disappeared. Those whom he had duped would cherish no friendly feelings toward him. Now, thought the tribune, the imposter has reappeared and the people were venting their rage on him. So they, that's who they thought Paul was. Well, do you remember what uh, we're going to pick up with Paul's, the rest of his speech next week. But do you remember Paul's uh, request in his prayer? What his very first request was, was in his prayer when he wrote to the Romans. That, that would have been about a year earlier. Look at what he asked them to pray one more time. Look at that. He says, I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together in your prayers to God for me. Look at this. First thing, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. And sure enough, God used those Roman soldiers in order to answer that prayer. And we already know that the second part of that prayer was answered, that his service to Jerusalem uh, would be acceptable to the saints. Now, the third part of the prayer, we're going to have to wait and see how that is answered by God. Well, why is this important? As we close out, let me back up just for a minute. There, there's that verse that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. It was close, but God did keep Paul from dying at the hands of the unbelievers in Judea. And uh, we see also that in Acts 22 and then Acts 23, we will see, read more about that. He did have to deliver him several times. Well, 
Why is this important? As we look back over our lesson today, let's think about what we've learned, okay? Now, we have seen the Holy Spirit. What have we learned about God? What have we learned from God? Let's think about that. Well, we have seen the Holy Spirit faithfully, how he warned Paul through the voices of many people along his trip to Jerusalem. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would tell us things to come. That's what Jesus said. That was one of the roles of the Holy Spirit. Note that the people were faithful to speak when prompted by the Holy Spirit. And I do want you to make a note of that, that uh, when the Holy Spirit moved them to speak, they did faithfully speak. But we also see, did you see the fellowship among the believers and their hospitality and their love for one another? Troy. As Tyre, Ptolemaeus, uh, 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 Caesarea, Jerusalem, all of these places that Paul had been, they gathered together, they prayed, they, they spoke to one another, they loved one another. Now, we answered the question, why would Paul continue on to Jerusalem? Knowing the danger? Well, we know the answer. He was fully surrendered unto the Lord, and he did not hold his life dear unto himself. There's the scripture reference, Acts 20, 24. We know that he loved his fellow Jews. He desired for them to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, Romans 10, 1. We know that the love of Christ constrained him. His love for Christ compelled him to share Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. And finally, he wanted to minister to the saints. There, he wanted to seal this fruit among them, Romans 15, 25 through 28. So when you look at this map right here, and that's the completion of Paul's third missionary journey, I just want you to think about that, that with his visit to Jerusalem, he closed the most active part of Paul's missionary activity. In a little less than a decade, he had won the freedom of the Gentile believers from the yoke of legalism. He had built a strong chain of churches from Antioch of Syria and Tarsus of Cilicia, straight across Southern Asia to Ephesus and Troas, and thence through Macedonia and Achaia to Lycra. He had chosen and trained companions like Luke, Timothy, Silas, Aristarchus, Titus, and others who were well qualified to maintain the work with him or without him. He had commenced an, an epistolary literature, which already was regarded as a standard for faith and practice. In his preaching, he had laid the groundwork for future Christian theology and apologetics, and by his plans, he pr pursued a statesmanlike campaign of missionary evangelism. His plans for a trip to Rome and Spain showed that he wanted to match the imperial commonwealth with an imperial faith. Notwithstanding his bitter and active enemies, he had established the Gentile church upon a firm foundation and had already formulated the essence of Christian theology as the Spirit of God revealed it to him. Think about that. All that we have studied, all by the Holy Spirit, all by the being obedient to what God was telling him to do. So as we close out, we ask ourselves, taking what we've learned, how, how does the Holy Spirit want us to implement what we've learned? I want you to think about this. When the Holy Spirit prompts us to speak and to warn people, are we faithful to do this just as all the believers were faithful concerning Paul's journey to Jerusalem? All the way along the way, he was taught to by the Holy Spirit through people who are faithful to speak. And then I want to ask you the question, did you love that hospitality? How they just opened up their homes and they prayed for one another? So ask yourself the question, are we hospitable and loving like the believers were at Troas and Tyre and Ptolemaeus and Caesarea and Jerusalem? And then I want to ask you this, are we willing like Paul to go into the very face of danger because the love of Christ compels us, because of our love to see the lost saved, because we are fully surrendered unto the Lord? When you look at this map right here, this is a map of the entire world. And Pastor Bart, in his teaching, he has taught us many times why we do missions, why we do missions. We do missions because God deserves to be worshiped by everyone. We do missions because Jesus commanded us to go and tell. We do missions because we love people and we want to share our joy with them. And we do missions because without Jesus, we are all sheep without a shepherd. That is what compels us to go to the hard and the dangerous places. And finally, I just want to ask you this question. Did you notice how Paul responded to the people who had just beaten him up and tried to kill him? Did you notice that? What does he say? He says, let me speak to them. Let me speak to them because he wanted to share the gospel with them. 
Though he no doubt was bloodied and beaten, his one thought now was to seize this occasion of speaking to the people when he had a great crowd before him with their attention fixed upon him. Think about that. Do we respond to people who, would, who have caused us to suffer like Paul did, desiring to share with them the gospel of truth that Jesus loves them and died for them? Father, as we close out this study, Lord, I am convicted because, Lord, there have been many times when I have shied away from the danger dangerous places, God, or I have held back from sharing with the, the gospel with other people. So, Father, I pray that you change that in me. I pray you begin that work in me, God, that I will be bold like, like Paul and be willing that, it, that I do not count my life dear unto myself, that I may finish my course with joy preaching and sharing and, and teaching and showing and speaking to other people of the grace of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that for my sisters and brothers in Christ, Lord God, that we will be focused upon the mission to which you have called us, the great mission, because God, you are worthy to be glorified. Jesus, you have commanded us to go into all the world and to share the gospel because somebody shared the gospel with us. We are recipients of someone being faithful to share the good news with us. And we love people and we want them to have this same kind of joy that we have. And Lord God, without you, we are all like sheep without a shepherd. So Father, to our good shepherd, to our great shepherd, who loves us and gave his life for us, willingly laid down his life for us. I pray that as your sheep, as you said, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. So this is my prayer today, God, for myself, for my family, and for the people at Kingsville. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. And next week, Acts 22, here we go. Have a good week.